similar to programming, right? It's hard for it to work if you're not using it correctly. Okay. So we have a, maybe like we'll go maybe 10 more minutes or so on the overview, because there's a few things we kind of closed on Tuesday with an interesting question, but we'll talk about some other things and we'll return to that. So, um, so we're still talking about security and we're talking about, so why do we care about laws or customs? Do those factor into, let's say, security analysis, security decisions, any of that? Yeah, well, when you're pen testing like websites, for example, if you don't follow the regulations you just said, if they're part of like a bug bounty program, mm -hmm. then you might not get a reward and be like sued or something. Yeah, worse, you may be thrown in jail, right, for breaking into somebody's system without their permission. So we can think about this, this is important to understand this from an offensive or a, let's say as a security researcher, somebody who's trying to maybe find bugs in systems. Uh, oftentimes you can work as a pen tester, so people will hire you to break into a company's, like the company itself will hire you to break into their own systems. And uh, other than that, there are bug bounty programs that they have, uh, we'll go over them in a bit, but uh, so basically the company gives you the right to test their systems as long as you follow their regulations, and if you're not following the regulations, then they can maybe come after you because you're in breach of that. Yes, yeah, so that's one way, yeah. Uh, interesting, so in what kind of, do you have an example in mind? So like, if you could, if you could keep it in like a completely secure database off the network, that'd be like a lot more secure than keeping it on the network versus breaking the access to your portal. Cool, so yeah, so the idea would be if there's laws, let's say, I mean, maybe a good example would be a medical database with medical records, like maybe for security reasons, you'd want to keep that off-site in a secure facility, but of course, if people can't access their medical records, that's a huge problem. Right, so they can't get the proper care they need. I'm sure there's probably some kind of laws against that. Yeah. Some security practices may not be supported by the state. So, like, say, if you're in the state, you want to protect your people by monitoring your access to the state, you want to protect your people by monitoring their like, data usage, you wouldn't be allowed to use the privacy. Interesting. So, yeah, there may be laws that impact what kind of mechanisms or policies we can put in place. Um, do I guess the question is how do those things actually exist and do they make a difference? Anybody work at a company? And do you have a computer that you use at that company? Do you think they're tracking, or do you know if they're tracking the websites that you visit? Do you know how they're doing it? It shouldn't be the case because you're using HTTPS, but uh, does anybody have a corporate owned machine that they can just hold up and won't ask you the corporate? There you go. See some corporate machines here, right? That probably have security policies that are dictated by the organization, software that's pre-installed on it. Uh, what they'll do is they'll put in a certificate on your device that is your device trusts, and then they'll have an endpoint that actually terminates your SSL connection, essentially performs a man in the middle on you, but your computer thinks it's trusted because it's trust that root certificate that it got. So uh, this way they can man in the middle of your traffic, see all the websites you're visiting. I don't hear any outrage. Is anybody outraged or <laughs> happy, not happy? Shouldn't there be laws against that and that we just talked about? It's their device. It's their device, so they can do whatever they want with it? Yeah. You don't have to work there. You don't have to work there? That's yeah. So if you sign a user agreement when you accept the device? Yeah, you probably signed some user agreement or something. Maybe it was buried in the terms of your employment on page five of a 50-page document where you had to sign an initial and everything. Yeah. As long as you aren't doing anything like horrendously illegal, what's the matter? You're buried in anonymity. There's not going to be somebody going through every single website and visit by hand. There's too many connections. Unless you're doing something to draw attention to yourself or give them reasons to have to look at your machine. But what about, let's say, going to visit LinkedIn? Would the company want to know that? You've gone there, why? It means you're probably going to leave them. Yeah, it, mean, it could mean you're looking for a job, right? They could maybe plot your LinkedIn usage versus other people's and see when you spike. They could do all this automatically without ever looking at the traffic, I mean, without looking at it manually. Then all of a sudden you get brought into your manager's office. And like, hmm, are you unhappy here? Do you you know, then maybe actually the more subtle thing would be if they start putting you on uh, unimportant projects. So they just start sidelining you into things that aren't mission critical because they think you're looking somewhere else, but maybe you're not, right? Um, yeah. What other types of laws, customs? Yeah. Like, like government surveillance. Mm. Government surveillance. So what kind of, what are you alluding to there? Do you have any specifics? Uh, I remember there was a case where I country it was, but like they had, I think it was they manually pulled like Google or something, and so like people were getting certificates that were not necessarily Google, but it was like they go to Google, but they're 
Yeah, so kind of thinking about now up from an organizational perspective, now to the country level. So this, the laws of the country could dictate what they can and cannot do if they can do large scale surveillance on this order or whatever they can do. Yeah, I don't remember the, I remember the story, but I don't remember the country. If anybody remembers, uh, feel free to say something. What other laws could impact your, let's say, your ability to secure, defend an organization? Yeah. Good. What was the name of the law again? I can't remember. It's a child online privacy prevention act. Oh, nice. Did you just make up that acronym from the uh, letters? Kappa? Yeah. So, yeah. So, you may actually have more requirements if you're not threat modeling and thinking about the laws that apply to you. Maybe you're um, leaving yourself open to liability risk that you should be aware of. Yeah. There's an interesting story about GDPR where someone um, pretended to be making a request on someone else's, well, they were making a request on someone else's behalf for their data. Um, and they were, the company was legally enforced to provide that. So it's kind of a gray area on what the requirements were. Yeah, so with GDPR, if anybody hasn't heard of that, that's something that the European Union has kind of dictated a whole set of privacy laws, some of which, I don't remember all the details, but some of which is you have the right to access, like get a copy of all the data that the company has on you. You also have the right to deletion, so they have to be able to delete um, you. If, I don't know, was anybody, was anybody involved in any GDPR work at a company? I've heard some horror stories from, oh yeah, you were? Yeah. Well, yeah. We're making an application for it for companies to use. Oh, interesting, <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so I know a friend who worked at a company and he said that it was very difficult to, because you have this thing of, let's say you have an app that's like, a, whatever, a chat app or something, and you have groups with group names. Those group names now are considered G, uh, GP, what's the acronym? GDPR. GDPR, yeah, sorry. Uh, GDPR relevant, and so now you can no longer host those names. Like, those names have to be considered sensitive, and so you have to, they have to re-architect a lot of their app to be able to, like, comply with these things. Yeah. Certain countries might require a Yeah, so a company could force you to insert a backdoor into your system. Why would they want to do that? Um, well, if it's a country, it could be for criminal reasons, such as you're doing some sort of black market thing, and they just want to. Hopefully, the opposite, so like law enforcement, right? right. So detect criminals, not for right. criminal activities. So you're going to cast doubt on a whole country. But. <laughs> that could be possible, but yeah, so they could want law enforcement access, right? And so you have to understand as a company. What are your legal obligations? What are you required to do? What kind of things can you use to protect yourself? You could actually think of maybe architecting your application in such a way that it's impossible for you to get that data, right? So, I mean, it's possible if you're not storing data, they can't request any data that you don't already have in the past. Um, but yeah, so all these things, right, are important things to think about. So. Um, other crazy things that may be crazy, um, it used to be, I think even in the US had an export law on cryptography. So certain cryptography algorithms and software could not be shipped outside of the country. Uh, there was a weird exemption that I remember about, which was that books were fine. So they would print the source code of crypto software into books and then ship those out of the country. And then people on the other side would then write those back in. So. Um, fortunately, at least in the U.S., we've kind of gotten away from this a little bit of mandating crypto and cryptography and these type of things. So, like, let's use the example of, let's assume, whatever, you had to, as a company, or let's say every crypto encryption scheme, whatever, the U.S. government wants to be able to access that, so they want some key. What are some of the threats or reasons maybe for or against that? say so one side on the against uh, to paraphrase would be uh, maybe the government is unfairly targeting people or targeting people for political reasons not law enforcement reasons so you would have maybe you could say then well but we'll put some checks and balances there where you have to go before some impartial judge 
to prove your case before you get access to this key. Yeah? They might lose that key. You might, they might lose the key? Is that actually a threat? I mean, maybe that's a good thing, right? <laughs> Depending on your perspective. Someone might, someone else might. Yeah, so that a lose is a kind of an interesting thing, right? I guess lose control of the key. So could you then revoke that key on every single piece of encryption that exists in the country easily? It's hard enough to get people to update their you know, Microsoft uh, Windows or their Mac OS online. Yeah? Kind of like a betrayal of your customers, too, if you're selling them Yeah, this may be exactly, this may put you at a business disadvantage compared to other countries, right? Your customers may go to and buy products from another country that doesn't have these restrictions, right? Yeah, so this is, these are kind of all the arguments. I think mean, there's more four arguments, right? Maybe nobody touched on like, yeah, maybe there are cases where, you know, you could take it to whatever terrorism or whatever bad thing that you want that law enforcement would really want access to these things. Um, Uh, another interesting question to consider, so you're an administrator of, let's say, a student cluster or a student whatever system, and because um, there's some, does general still exist, ASU system? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so let's say you're an admin of general, and some students says, yeah, I have a problem, whatever, logging into my home directory, or there's weird problems. Um, but on, so that's on one hand. On the other hand, there are privacy laws that protect student information and student data. So what if they go in and they see whatever your homework or your grades or something, could that restrict them from doing their job? Like is there a trade-off between privacy and the company needing to do or the organization needing to do what it needs to do? Doesn't that fall into FERPA? Like they just have to remain quiet uh, about whatever they see and try to see as, as least as possible? Yeah, so maybe maybe there's FERPA stuff, maybe we're in a different country, so different laws apply that require different things. Yeah, that could be one thing. What else? Yeah, far back. Yeah, so the uh, response was, well, maybe then you could have a policy where you have training of your employees and your administrators so that they're aware of this, they're aware of these laws so that they can work around it. Yeah, these are all great things. So uh, what's the difference between a law and a custom? Yeah. I would say like a law. Yeah, yeah, still you, sorry. Okay. I would say like a law is like what applies. I mean, that's something that's prosecutable, I guess. Okay, so like codified law versus, let's say, I don't know, standards of behavior, or maybe you have, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say, kind of like a custom would be like a social norm of the country, wherever you're at, just like an, an expectation. Right, so like it may be, le I don't know if this is, but it could be legal for me to say, uh, I'm gonna search through all of your computers because uh, I'm worried about plagiarism in the class, so I'm gonna check all of your computers every time you enter this room, let's say, right? That could be something that's legal. I actually don't know, so don't quote me on that. I, it's probably not, but let's say it is for now. Uh, is that something I'm probably likely to do? What, what prevents me from doing that? What was that? Time. Time? Yeah, definitely. But what else? Let's say I, I really was insane about plagiarism. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to feel like a little weird? Just looking for a thing? Yeah, it feels really weird, right? It violates so, like social norms and customs. Like, I don't want to see everything that's on your computer. Trust me, um, and you shouldn't want me to see it either. So it's good. We should have this separation, right? But these are so. Anyways, these are kind of related topics to think about in the terms of security. Is yes, there may not be legal reasons of why you can't do something, but it there are society norms, and it, they may vary from place to place, which I think is interesting. Um, okay, let's talk about microchip implants for one more second, because I think this kind of ties into these things. Maybe you want to implant a microchip in your finger? So what are the pros and cons of this? So we talked about this at the end on Tuesday. 
So the company did this to their employees. They're in Sweden, so you could say our laws don't apply. I'm sure some laws apply, but um, so that they can get access to buildings, they don't have to lose a key card, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Faster. Fascinating? Faster. Faster. Yeah, so a, con a pro would be that it's easier, right? It makes your life easy. You just, boop, don't ever need to forget your key. Yeah. It's more secure in the sense that since you can't get the key card, you don't have to worry about Yeah, so it could be more secure, right? It kind of depends on, again, what the actual, what the mechanism is, how that works. But yeah, you could think of, it's, we could say definitely this, it's a lot more difficult to lose your finger than it is lose your key card. You can still lose your finger. Yeah. I guess one with the key card, it's more discreet because people can't see when you work. Interesting. So another thing, yeah, do you ever, I don't know if this is a problem here. It definitely is in San Francisco. If you go out, you can see people like wearing their company key badge, like badges. And so you can see exactly where everyone works. It's kind of weird. Bad from a security perspective. Yeah. Um, I guess a bad side of it would be that it's the company forcing its rules onto your personal body. Yeah, like where does it end, right? I mean, would you do, so key, like whatever, microchip. What about like a tattoo? What about, I don't know. I guess we get sci-fi like cybernetic implants or something. What about into your phone? What if they then implant and force you to run some stuff on their phone? Yeah. Well, like another con argument would be the company's putting it in there. So like, I don't know what the company, like I don't know if they have like a tracker in there. Like, yeah, exactly. You don't know what else is going on in this thing. And maybe it's actually tracking your location. So your boss brings you in and be like, Hmm, I see that you're only spending uh, six hours a day at work, but you're logging eight hours into the system. Why is that? And you would know that because of the geolocation, right? Yeah. I mean, aside from like losing your badge or anything, it still has the same issue that RFID has, right? Because you can still be able to copy what's going on in the person's microchip effectively. Uh, I would say it's super secure, whatever. It's got a burned in uh, private key in there that you can't get out without destroying it. Could assume that, but yes, there could be problems, right? And that's one issue. Let's go in the back. Yes, uh, unique person, person. Yeah, so that's I think somebody mentioned that like the risk of getting your finger cut off to get access to the company. Like it's a card, you can just say take the card, right? Uh, more difficult to say just take the finger. Yeah. Uh, how easily is it to take it out after you fired? Yeah. Do you have to like get surgery and then you get hired back six months later because you can't find a job and then like, you can't put it back in? And at a certain point, they start running out of fingers to put it on, and yeah, that's kind of weird. Yeah. And one person does get their finger cut off, everyone has to replace theirs. Oh, see, that's an interesting point. Yeah, let's say it's uniquely identified. So it's like a normal, like a badge identifies you as a person. So if you stole my key card, I don't have to get rekeyed. But that would be a definite worry. Yeah. Yeah, if you upgrade the system, right? So if you upgrade to some next-gen key cards that have better encryption, you just give out new key cards to everyone versus issuing new microchips that go into people's brain or finger. Although maybe on the flip side, it's actually easier maybe to update the software on a microchip that's running in your finger. Just run everyone through and update, get some wheel that spins. Anyways, uh, this is a cool topic. Sorry, uh, we don't have tons of time to spend on this. We've already spent more time than I thought. Um, the other thing I want us to think about is that security doesn't happen in a vacuum. This is something that we've tried to talk about a bit with kind of the trade-offs, the cost-benefit analysis of security, but also the human issues. So let's say, well, think about an organization. So you're in charge of securing some organization. Why do you care about humans? Shouldn't you just be caring about like operating systems and updates and patches and all that fun stuff? Yeah, so you worry about, from a threat standpoint, humans are the ones that make the mistakes. What else? Yeah. Software doesn't really have motivational issues. Humans do, so you can motivate somebody to do something that they probably shouldn't be doing. Interesting. That's a very good way of putting it. Yeah, so you don't have to worry about the motivations of your employees. Maybe thinking about, if you're talking motivation in terms of uh, getting bribed to do something, right? That could be one thing to worry about. What else? Let's say it's not, not about your work. You're not worried necessarily about the employees themselves becoming targets or something. Yeah? Like an overly complicated system will encumber the humans. Yeah, so humans are smart, right? They'll try to, if the 
system is so cumbersome, they'll try to find ways around it. Right, so human behavior, holding doors open. Uh, what about, how much money do you have to secure your organization? deciding to give you a budget. Who is that person? What's their relationship? What's the organizational structure like? Um, so thinking about who's responsible for security in an organization. Or is it some, uh, let's say it's the head of IT who reports is in charge of security. They have a whole security group under them. They report to some VP of IT who reports to some president of whatever who reports to the CEO. Um, How's that different from somebody who, like the chief information security officer who reports directly to the CEO? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so if the CISO, if you're regularly meeting with your boss, the CEO, who's supposed to be the one that makes all the decisions, and you say, you know, we really need to increase the security budget, I'm worried about all these problems, like we don't want to become another Equifax or whatever, uh, that person has the authority to say, okay, you, I will, whatever, give you another five million or double your budget or whatever you need, right? Versus if you're way down the food chain and you have to convince your boss who has to convince their boss who has to convince their boss who has to convince somebody. Uh, it's a lot more difficult. Also, yeah, please. And there's another issue with that chain would be, I mean, the lower down, the more technical the person, the higher up, the more abstracted from it. So the message will be watered down by the time it reaches whoever can make the actual decision. Yeah, you ever play the game of telephone? Right? Could be a problem. What about, think about a different way. So let's say you're developing some software and you have a security group, and part of your security group does essentially red teaming of bug finding on your application. And they find a remote code execution, really bad vulnerability in your application, and what happens? Does that bug get fixed? Yeah. Yeah, you have to actually, right, you can't just go in and change it. You're a security group. You're probably separate from the development team who's trying to crank on features to make their deadline. And now you come in with this insane new bug or crash that's probably very complicated. And so oftentimes they'll tell you to go away, right? Or they'll be like, ah, we'll fix it maybe next cycle, especially if you don't have a proof of concept that shows exactly why it's so bad. Right, so that's again another organizational structure. What's the organization of the company look like and how does security relate to development and all these other places, right? And these are insanely important things to think about, otherwise you'll uh, just be spinning your wheels finding stuff and nothing ever gets fixed. These are not hypothetical concerns. These are concerns I've heard from people who work at companies. Uh, budget, organizational power, who enforces security, great. Cool, I think we covered all these issues. Yeah, humans are tricky, but um, they are very important. All right, that was twice as long as I thought. On to access controls. All right, so what is, so we actually defined this, I think, earlier, so somebody kind of refresh us a little bit. What do we mean by access control? Who's allowed to access what? And what was that last part you said? And maybe from where? Yeah, so who's supposed to access things? Who's not supposed to access things? Um, the from where is very interesting. And how does this tie in with policies and mechanisms and all that stuff we've been talking about? Yeah. Right, so that's actually a great um, the tool argument. Yeah, or data, I think is another way to think about it. 
um, in law firms. So law firms have pretty strict uh, uh, conflict of interest that can come up. So you're defend you may be if you've defended a client and you've had access to their information, you can't now be on the other side of that client, right? So they don't want you to have access to both those information because that's unfair. And so they actually have uh, access control policies and stuff in place to handle this. Um, so let's talk about an, an example. So we have a university's academic integrity policy disallows cheating. That's probably true, right? Most universities have this, I think. So this includes, so the policy says it includes copying homework with or without permission. Some random, whatever, um, computer science class has students do homework on a shared ser server. We'll say it's similar to general at ASU.edu, so it's a server everyone has access to. So student A forgets to re-protect their homework file, and student B copies the file. So this is actually, so who did something wrong? Both? Yeah. Student A for not protecting their file. So student A for not protecting their file. Student B for copying it. The administrator for allowing, creating a system such that student A can make their files readable by other people. It's probably fair, right? Yeah. But everyone's liable. Burn it all down. <laughs> yeah. The professor for making them do the homework. Ah, the professor <laughs> for making them do the homework. Interesting. It says nothing about a professor. <laughs> assume that there's somebody in charge all of the facade. Uh, yeah, so I think all of these are interesting things, right? Because we have this high-level policy, and inherent in this policy, there's some access control rules, right, about who should be able to access what. Students should not be able to copy each other's homework assignments. And here we have a case of a student who maybe forgot to re-protect, and this could be, of course, what they say, or maybe they deliberately changed the permissions on their file such that it's world readable. Um, maybe that changes it for you, maybe it doesn't. So why does the system allow this state to happen? Because it's a shared server? Could you create, could you envision a system that does not allow this? So then you have other questions of how do you grade the homework, right? How is the, um, so you have, somebody needs to be able to read homework, but maybe then we just talked about um, maybe different roles. Maybe there's a grader account that has access to read files or something. Yeah. Cool. So kind of access control is thinking about all these different ways of what is the system? So what, what kind of rules do we want? How do we specify those rules? How can we enforce those rules? How can we think about, does the system actually have the security property that we want? Because maybe when you get rid of the system, if it allows this part to happen, right? Cool. Before we do that, we need to talk about some important concepts. So there's, we'll get into um, different things later, but so what is authorization? What does that mean? Permission. Permission, that's a good way to phrase it. Yeah, so it's kind of in a sense, what can you do on the system or what can a user do on the system? And how do I know who you are? Yeah, but I need to somehow be able to answer the who are you question, right? So this is a concept of authentication. The main way we've been thinking about this is username and passwords that you're very familiar with. We'll talk about that in more depth. Um, but here, this answers the question of who are you? So it's important to remember and think in your mind that these are two distinct concepts. 
right? The who are you, how do I identify you is actually a very deep, tricky problem. But that's the authentication. Now that I know who you are, what are you allowed to do would be authorization. So what would be, and we keep going back to this example, like badges in a uh, company. So what would be those two steps? Yeah. So if I'm entering the building, I would need my badge to get in, and that would be authorization. And there could be like a security guard matching my uh, picture to the face on the badge, and that would be authentication. Cool. OK, so yeah, the fact that, so or even going it back a little bit further, right? The fact that you got this badge that has your picture on it from the company, they maybe checked your passport to verify your identity before they issued you this badge. They gave you this badge, and then when you badge in, there's some authorization process that says you may not be allowed into every door inside the building. There's probably areas you're not allowed to go. Um, and then maybe there's another layer of authentication that's trying to look at a guard trying to match that badge picture with your face. Cool. All right. So how do we think about what people should be able to do? So we're defending a system. So authorization is about deciding what people should be able to do. How do we, we just think of it? Yeah. I mean, we give them the minimum that they need to get their job done. And as the requirements increase, we can increase access. Yeah. So. We can actually think about it on kind of different abstraction levels, right? We can think, okay, rather than think about you as an individual, we can think about what is your role in this system. So rather than thinking about you each individually, I just see you all as 216 students. And I think, what is a student allowed to do? And then I can create rules on that. So I say, great, you are a student. You can do X, Y, and Z. Um, yeah. And then... And then how does that fit in with trust? So you said just enough to get your job done. Why don't I give you more authorization to do everything? Yeah. Inherent security risk. If you give an entry level employee to access to the CEO, it's more risk than you need to take. Right, so it may be more risk. And you actually may not give even the CEO all of the authorization and access, right? You could have checks and balances such that the CFO is actually the one who can authorize wire transfers or money transfers, which the CEO can't do. They could ask the CFO to do that, right? So, yeah, so you have this concept of trust in the sense of what, what can this person, this role do in the system and what should they be able to do, right? So let's say you had access to some shared system, like general, and there was just a command you could run to become the root user, which is the administrator of the whole system. That's probably not going to accomplish the security policy that I want, right, of each of you having separate accounts and not being able to read each other's files. So what about risk? How does risk factor into this? related to complexity maybe?
Right, so yeah, so think about like a complex system. So we can go back and maybe to the privacy component, right? So you can say, okay, developers in our company, they are great, but they need to sometimes debug issues that happen in production. So I give the developers access to the production database. And maybe you don't realize that then actually they have full access to your system, all their data, not just to debug an issue, but to maybe look at people's private information, which you don't want and you restrict from actually all the other users. So even at companies like um, Google, if you want access to user data, you have to go through several layers of approval to get it and then you get time limited things and they make sure that you're not extracting any actual identifying information and all this, um, these steps, right? Because a, what can be a very easy let's say authorization of saying like, well, I just need access to the database to do my job, obviously. And then you forget that this then means they have access to everything in your system. Cool, can you eliminate risk? No, why not? Somebody burrowing in and over, yeah. let's say, a hundred years getting in or whatever, right? Yeah, can you reduce to a reasonable degree, or, or could you even say to a reasonable degree, you've eliminated all reasonable risks? Maybe, but no. Maybe, exactly. Maybe, but then you have those unknown unknowns that you don't quite, maybe you haven't considered or thought about, right? Uh, that then it will completely change the way you consider the security of that system. Um, another way to kind of think about this is you're using your access control rules in order to reduce risk, right? So you're restricting the capabilities of people, hopefully to the minimum set that is required for them to do their jobs and nothing more. And then that way they, you have reduced risk in the system. Great. Okay. So again, we're gonna be splitting hairs here a little bit. So kind of the way I like to think about these concepts, so you have this broad notion of authorization, which has its twin of authentication, or maybe not twin, but related sibling, I don't know if this is a bad analogy, but um, then you have access control. So I think of it as, and this is uh, very similar to what we've been talking about in the last uh, section, so authorization you can think of as the policy, who should be able to access what, and then access control is actually the mechanism that enforces that, right? So going back to the example, the authorization policy should be that, let's say users should not be able to read each other's uh, homework assignments. But the mechanism that's enforcing that presumably is some Unix model where a user can actually change the permissions of files they own to make them world readable. There's a mismatch there between our mechanism is not actually enforcing the policy that we want. And we'll kind of see this over and over again. Does this make sense? Questions? Cool. Okay. And to kind of drive this home a bit, what we're going to do is we're going to think about we're going to try to model access control rules in terms of what do we want to have happen. This has the nice benefit of we've talked about modeling and formalism is nice because maybe you can prove properties of a system. Um, and this is how a lot of this access control modeling is used. You can create this nice model of your system. You can prove that it's never the case that somebody can transition it into an insecure state. Uh, the other interesting thing is thinking through, so we're thinking about these beautiful abstract models, but of course, these don't just live in our minds. They have to actually be implemented on computer systems or other types of systems that we need to use. So we can see maybe the mismatches there of, like I talked about, and alluded to with the Unix systems. So when we do this modeling, there's not a lot of symbols, I promise. This is not, you know, don't get caught up in the uh, symbology here. So we have our subjects, we're going to call them S. So this, and these are things in the system that can act 
or do something. Right? This may depend on the exact system we're talking about. So think about a computer system. So your laptop that's sitting on a, your desk right now, what would be some subjects involved? The user? What else? Yeah. The people around the user? and software yeah so actually and as we'll kind of dig in a little bit more you are not actually technically doing anything on your computer you're maybe type let's say the command line you're typing some stuff in you hit enter what actually happens magic you type ls and you hit enter yeah, so a process is spawned, and who spawns that process? Do you spawn it? The operating system. Almost. Shout out. Who asked the operating system to spawn the new process? What was it? Somebody said the shell. The shell, right? Your shell, so you're running it. So when you're on a terminal, you're talking to a program, which is your shell. It's probably bin dash or bin bash or whatever after CSH. We won't get into any arguments there. So when you type in ls and hit enter, the process bash needs to figure out what LS program you're talking about. It looks through your path to try to find the program. And then it asks the operating system, please spawn up a new process called slash bin slash LS. Then the operating system does that, spawns a new process that maybe you can ask the operating system to spawn other processes. So technically, you're not doing anything, even though it feels like you are. You're just asking another program to do stuff on your behalf. Right? So in that case, your subjects here are going to be actually uh, processes. So objects. So objects. So if a subject is a thing on the system that can act, what would an object be? Things that be acted Yeah. Wow. That's okay. Yeah. That's good. I'm just saying things in the system or things that can be acted upon. Uh, yeah. I guess that is what I put here. Okay. That's right. So. And this could be, this could include subjects, it could not. I mean, all this depends on the exact system, right? So this is the nice thing about a model. We're thinking about this at a high level, right? Um, and then we have some rights. So this is, again, kind of thinking about permissions, basically asking the question of what can the subject <laughs> do to the object, right? So thinking about a Unix system and thinking about a file, right? One right could be read. So can a process read this file? What are some other rights that you've seen? Yeah. To write to the file? Right. Why do you want to separate reading and writing to a file? Because it files. It's okay if sometimes if they read it, but if they change it, then it might like show false information or might turn in the file. Yeah, okay, so this is a good question. So then what would be some scenario where your authorization policy would require that somebody can only write to something and not, or let's say only read to something and not write to something. Yeah. Maybe it's like a company directory. Okay, a company directory. And what, can you explain a little bit more? Why, why do they not want uh, everyone to be able to read and write to it? Um, well, every, everyone should be able to read it. Perfect. And this gets back to the concept of limiting risk, right? You don't want you want you don't want some rogue employee to deface or whatever, change or alter the company directory. So a company directory would be, let's just say, the list of people who work there and phone numbers in the company, right? So you need to contact person X, you can look up their name and you can call them on the phone, right? So yeah, you want everybody, everybody in the company should be able to read this, but if you allowed everyone to write to it, you're assuming more risk that a rogue employee will make changes or even accidental changes, right? So you probably want it to be one person's job to write, and when you have a new employee or somebody's terminated, to update that list, that's a great example, right? So that's why it makes sense to think about these different rights in terms of kind of separation. So we talked about reading, writing, what are some other things? Execute. Execute, yeah, so RWX, so read, write, execute, anything else? Deletion. deletion, yeah, so why would we want to separate deletion from the others?
Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, that's maybe, so you, or maybe another way to phrase that would be like append or something. So you can add to the file, but you can't delete what was already there. So yeah, de like there's deleting the file itself. There's deleting the contents of the file. Um, yeah, that's interesting. What else? Yeah. Kind of like Facebook doesn't lend you updating information, but they don't want you to delete it necessarily from their servers. Yeah, so that's an interesting one, right? So yeah, has anyone deleted a Facebook account before? And then undeleted it by going back and logging in? Yeah, it's amazing how your data still magically comes <laughs> back, right? It's almost as if it was never deleted in the first place. Yeah. I don't know if anyone in the room has, but have you ever tried to delete your Amazon account? Yes, it <laughs> no, I would never think of that. It, you need like a little tutorial how like you need to go like eleven pages deep and then you can't do it, you need to contact like your customer support. <laughs> then it needs to go up a chain and then they delete it for you. Whoa, that's yeah. crazy. <laughs> Actually, so I would recommend that. well, anyways, Amazon is very nice if you ever um, have to apply for something and you just put like the last whatever X places you've lived. Like for me, Amazon has all of that <laughs> Going back, I think more than a decade now. So yeah, Amazon has a much better memory than I do of where. Cool, so is there anything that's missing from here? Is there any other things that we need to worry about? Besides like specific what's in these sets? Create actions. Wait, what? So, define create. Yes. Okay. So great. So, but that would be a write, right? So that would be inside this set. Is there any other sets that are missing? So thinking on more meta level, can we actually model any type of authorization that policy that we want using just these three sets? Actions in what sense? Um, so like the different things that the system or in the system that can act, but what are those things that they can do? You know, and so you have these rights that are permission that are permitted to do or not do certain things. What are those things? You know? Yeah, exactly. So we're missing. That's great. Uh, we are missing the essentially the semantics, right, of or the, the system of what what are these actions? Cool. We'll actually tie. We're going to cheat and we'll tie those into rights. So the rights themselves will basically have semantics on what they mean. Cool. All right. So, how do I best want to do this? Okay. Great. All right. Sorry. We're going to get into the nothingness for a second. Back exactly where we were. Okay, so <coughs> yeah. okay, I didn't set this all up properly. Okay, we have subjects, objects, rights. So let's make things simple, and of course, because we're using some kind of map, we want to. Uh, we'll just use letters. Is that easy? We, well, these can be anything, but we'll use letters for right now. And I'm going to cheat and use the exact same letters that are in this slide. Great. Okay. So we have U and we have V. Can everybody distinguish between these two letters based on my terrible handwriting? In the back, can you read this? Or do I need to go bigger? Good. Okay, got a thumbs up. Awesome. So objects in our system. Let's say we have a file F. Some file G, and now what about U and V? Can we act upon them? Right, so we said subjects for things that can act. So we'll say we have, let's say, uh, at this point we'll say we have two users, U and V. And for objects, we have some files. We'll think of them as files, whatever. Essentially they can be whatever we want, F and G. But would U and V necessarily be in our Objects. So are U and V programs or users? I don't know. What do you want? You said users. So sure, users. Let's go with users for now. Do we want them to be in our objects? When would you want to act upon a user, let's say? Yeah. You want to maybe change their rights, right? So you have the rights are the set. So 
We talked about rights, but we didn't talk about who has what rights and changing those rights over time, right? So think about in an organization getting promoted, right? You need additional rights. You need to actually maybe act upon and act upon one of your objects, which would be a user. Maybe you need to delete a user, right? Um, I don't know, what other things? Demote them, remove rights, not just add them. So we'll add them to our object set. set. So we'll have U and B beautifully in here. All right. And then we have our rights. Okay, these are just super lame. So we're just going to say we have uh, whatever they want. And again, this is, oh wow. Uh, this is a um, abstract model, so it doesn't really matter what we what we put here. So we'll have R1, R2, all the way up to, I think, let's say R6, because why not? Okay. So the question becomes, how do we represent who has what rights? So let's say, we'll give it slightly more semantic names. We'll say like R1 is read. Would we just say like you, whatever, the rights of you is the second thing R1, so the user uh, the user use rights are R1. It's like a user can read. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know what they're reading, right? We don't know what the user's reading. We want to see what does you, Ursula, I don't know. I'm trying to, I don't know what a good you person name is, but, um, right? So it doesn't make sense to assign that, say, a subject or a user has specific rights because, well, what do they have rights to do to what? Or maybe it doesn't make sense. So in our ideal case, what would we want? So what would we want to say here? Yeah. Uh, you could go with kind of back to the idea of a job and say, OK, well, this class of job has this uh, set, of, set of rights. So mm -hmm. we're going to say this user is a this type of user which has this set of rights. But again, would that be rights on every object? How would you be able to differentiate reading file F versus file G? Yeah. <clears throat> maybe U has R1 rights on F or something like that. Yeah, so then maybe we think about breaking it down a bit, and we can think of, OK, we have U, and this is going to get a little ugly, don't worry. Uh, I'm just doing the formalism here just to be a little bit more precise. So we have U. What rights does it have on, let's say, F? Right? So in this example, we'll say you can, R1, can read file F. And we'd have to specify this for every object in our system, right? Make sense? So how would I represent that the use, uh, user U has, let's say, no rights on, and I'm just making up this formalism, by the way. This is not this, whatever syntax I'm using now is not very important right now, just in case you're stressing about it. But G, so the user U has rights on file G. What if I wanted to say they have no rights? To, to the empty set? Empty set. And so can I do this for all subjects and objects? If I just kept going? Yeah. 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 Wouldn't it make way more sense to just say what type of file or object it is? So have, not just have. Uh, subject types, but have object types. So for this object type, you need these types of permissions. And these, you know, and then this user has this set of permissions based on the role. And then if they match up like a key, you're good. So you can actually, so it really depends on what level of abstraction you're thinking of, right? You can actually think of U and Z as individual users, or you could think of them as roles. And the same thing with the files, right? So. If you had a mapping from role U to a set of users, you could do that. Um, the nice thing about this, we're thinking about what's the like, let's say, could you, in some sense, we're trying to answer the question of could, what model could you use to model any kind of access control policy? Because maybe 
I have a user you like you is in a specific role of uh, programmer, but they also are a security officer, and so they need complex permissions. And if we can't express that in this model, then this model is useless, right? So at least this way, we could specify exactly what they need and write it all down, and we could know exactly who has what rights on what objects in our systems. I understand the impulse to abstract because, of course, you're thinking, well, this is going to be insane, right? Because how are you going to write all this down for a system, like a real system? Uh, so you need some abstraction, but this actually gives us those capabilities. Okay. So if I just like kept going here, right? And I, I think maybe I'd end with uh, the user. Ah, come on, me now. So if I kept going, I'd say. VRV has some set, we'll call it whatever, R6, right? So by writing all these sets down, I can specify exactly. But if we look, so I'm writing for every subject of my system, right? All the users and all the objects, I'm specifying sets. Wouldn't that be much better and easier to represent in like a table or a matrix? than just writing it down here. So let's do that. And we'll do that uh, not by hand, because we have computers and it's already done for us. So if I told you this was some access control matrix, and I said, uh, can you, does you have rights R5 on V? Would you be able to answer that question? Yes, why? How? Look at the matrix. You'd say U has rights R5 on V. Great. Right? So we can represent, and, we, and this um, model can be as complex as we want, right? We can have whatever, thousands of rows in our column for all of our subjects. We can have millions of columns for all of our objects. And every row we have the properties. Is there a is there something you wouldn't be able to represent here? Properties. What's that? Or no, no, sorry, I was thinking about abstraction stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so we definitely don't have what the rights means and we don't have the semantics. Let's ignore that for now. We'll say we We'll define those later in some sense. Yeah? Which one is the user and which one is always that way or do you switch? Like, just as far as access. Yeah, I mean, I would go by convention. You'll have uh, the subjects as rows and the objects as columns. But it's a matrix. You just flip it this way. It's exactly the same. Okay, so subjects. You can think of it as it's always going to be wider. If you always include subjects in your objects, it will always be wide. So, that hot dog style. Okay, cool. So now we can actually. So this would be our ideal way. And why does this have problems? So you're going to secure an organization. You say I need an access control. <coughs> or, so I need some access control. Are you gonna write down this matrix? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty bulky is a good way of putting it. But even just starting with simple, right? Think about how many files are on your computer right now. The hundreds of thousands. Probably upwards of five hundred thousand. I actually don't know. This would be an interesting question to to do. How many files are on a standard Linux install? Right? So how many columns would you have then? Over 500,000. Yeah, you'd have over 500,000 plus all of the user accounts. So, so then, so, I kinda, so that now we can actually think about in this model different types of access control systems. So we can think about the Unix model. So we talked about what are subjects in the Unix model. In Unix, so on like a Linux system. So 
a Unix, like the broad Unix family root. of systems. Was it? Root. So root would be, let's say, a subject, kind of. This is where it gets slightly complicated, but. <coughs> the process, right? Every process on your system is a subject. Those processes are associated with a user ID and a group ID. This is where it gets complicated. That's why we're talking more simplified model. So just think about it as process. Your subjects, you have process. Let's say your process is P and Q. File, we can actually have, now we're simplifying it, right? So we're defining our objects as just the files. So we're actually ignoring what a process can do with another process. There's all kinds of rights and weird stuff there. And the rights could be something like read, write, execute, append, or own. So then, based on our, our understanding of systems, what do these rights mean? So if these are just files, so what does read mean? You can read the file, write, execute, execute the file, append. You can add to the file, but not delete it, and not delete anything that came before. What about O? O. You can change rights on it? Yeah, so you can, that user, so semantically, so <coughs> if we think about, and we talked about the uh, access control model, this is kind of a static snapshot of the current system. Do you agree? Right? So what happens if a new user appears? Like we hire a new employee for this company of two people. Yeah, we need to have a new row. We got to decide exactly what rights that new uh, person has on each of those. So we need to define those steps. So all the subjects can act using these rights on the objects. So our subject is a process. So what happens if a subject calls execute on a file? So let's think about that. What about read? So what are the semantics? What happens to our matrix if a subject calls read on a file? Yeah? Yes, let's say it is. So let's say it's reading a file that it has the right to read that file. What happens to our model? Think about it in terms of steps, right? So the model looks like this. It's trying to read a file that it has read access to. It does that. Then what does the matrix look like after that? Yeah. Uh, okay, so now we have P 
now we have a new process Q. So we have file F. And depending on the semantics of the system, maybe Q has different properties. Right? Whatever. So whatever rights it's going to have, it's going to have in here. And now if Q needs to do something, like we said, it would read a file, create a file, whatever, that would then change this model. Right? Um, cool. So then, what about own? Oh. So what happens if P, can, P owns F? zero permissions on. Yeah. Yeah, so ownership allows you to change the permissions, right? And maybe, so maybe, and then now, again, this is where we come to semantics, right? We're defining what these actions mean. So we can say P calls, let's say, own on F and adds, uh, whatever, read and write. Again, the syntax here is not important at all. What's important is that by the semantics here, read, write, O. Right, so now by invoking this write, P is able to change the permissions on there, and maybe depending on our system, it can change it for all the other um, subjects too. Cool, so then we can look at a, we can look at and we can represent the broad at a very simplified Unix level of a system. And we can look at, we can say, and so this is where, so what are, we'll, we'll go over here a little bit. What are some of the benefits and drawbacks of this access control with using a matrix to model this? Yeah. Oh, sure. I think, yes, because you can, I mean, depends on exactly the system, but I think in a general Unix model, you can, let's say you can give ownership to somebody else. So in some sense, you can revoke it from you and give it to another subject. I don't know if it's possible. I mean, there's always like a nobody user that you can give ownership to. So what are kind of the benefits or the drawbacks here? Yeah. Yeah, benefit would be, let's see, I'd say straightforward to understand, also straightforward to do an access control check, right? So let's say you're writing this operating system and you've given it this current access control matrix and you get a request from process P to execute file G, what do you do? And you just do a simple lookup and you'd say reject, right? This actually is a very efficient, easy operation. Drawback would be like something that wants to use this matrix may not understand what some of the symbols are, so may not understand what read or read only. Or yeah, so we need to make sure that our semantics here are precisely defined and that everyone understands them. Yeah. Um, they could just get really large because you might not ever care if you can act on G, but it's going to have a full column. Yeah, so I, I kind of lied, right? I said it's efficient to look up what P can do to G, but if you have 10 million columns, and every time you add a new user to the system, you're adding 10 million more columns. At some point, you're going to run out of space. Right? So think about using this on a system with 216 of you and how big that matrix is going to get. Yeah. If you were to actually use the matrix as your way of authenticating people, like whoever home that basically knows your entire system. Yeah, so you need to worry about the security of this model, how does it live. You can assume it's trusted in, let's say, the operating system kernel. 
So I want you to think about the drawbacks here, the benefits, and we'll look at other ways of modeling it and how this is actually done in practice because this is very important.